I'm Chaz Klunchak, and today on Klunchak's Killer Collection, we're going to take a look at Friday the 13th, the final chapter. While part two will always be my favorite of the series, the final chapter is the quintessential Friday the 13th film for the following reasons. It features a living, breathing Jason in a hockey mask at Camp Crystal Lake. The final chapter is everything you need to understand about the longevity of the series in 91 minutes. Let's go to the screening room and Friday I'll prove it. the 13th, it. the final chapter, begins with a technical finesse not seen before in the series. The opening shot begins with a crane carrying a camera operator who is wearing a steady cam. The operator proceeds to step from the crane onto the grisly scene of Jason Voorhees' last escapade at Camp Crystal Lake. The director walks us through a painstakingly recreated concluding scene from the previous installment. Nineteen months had passed since the previous film's release, making the time span between the third and the fourth installment the longest at that time. It had already been generally accepted that Jason Voorhees had been killed, so director Joseph Zito made sure that he gave us exactly what we expected, a very plausibly dead Jason. But it isn't long before we see that Jason is clearly alive as a puff of steam pours through the sheet. Jason, as expected, wakes up angry and gets down to business almost immediately. The first two kills are unexpectedly violent and directed with precision. And for the first time in the history of the franchise, Jason is more than menacing. He's terrifying. And bringing that terror to bloody color are the special effects of mastermind Tom Savini, who'd worked on the original film. Of course, Jason immediately returns to his home of Camp Crystal Lake to find a new batch of inattentive victims to dispatch. Among them is the Jarvis family. The final chapter boasts some notable industry names. Lawrence Monason and Crispin Glover, both veterans of underground teen exploitation films by 1984, turn in excellent performances with sellable chemistry. The likability of these characters makes the threat of Jason all the more threatening. Tommy, the youngest member of the Jarvis family, played by a pre-Goonies Corey Feldman, plays a crucial role in the Friday the 13th saga. His character would return twice more during the series, forming a mid-franchise trilogy that guaranteed sequels for quite a few more years. The Jarvis house is just across the way from a house rented by unsuspecting teens intent on living large at Crystal Lake. While this setup is certainly nothing new, the authenticity of the overall film generated suspense that was previously reserved for impatience. The pseudo-menacing looking mom is also a nice nod to the original picture. All of these components keep us in familiar territory, and while that sounds like criticism, the capable filmmakers manage to make a scary movie. What makes the final chapter unique is that it manages to do the following. Pick up where the last film left off, give us our familiar characters, give us new characters, give us a subplot to the subplot, make us pay attention to things that happened in the other three movies, and still, there is nothing muddled about the plot or pacing. And the film comes in at a comfortable 91 minutes. This is how a good Friday the 13th film operates. This is how it's done. This is the one to spend 91 minutes of your life on that you won't want back. Jason finally does get down to business. It's interesting, it's violent, it's scary, and it's gruesome. The final chapter's last act is a class act. And because you are clearly questioning my understanding of the word class, let me put it to you like this. The film delivers what it should. Jason's menace to the Jarvis kids in the final chapter is a classic matchup. Jason always means business, but this time, the kids do too, and they fully intend to win this showdown. I can clearly remember sitting in a theater on April 14th, 1984, an afternoon matinee the day after the film premiered, and cheering when Jason got a television smashed on his head.
The film's conclusion is particularly brilliant because it also serves as an introduction for the next two films. As a matter of fact, some would argue that after Tommy Jarvis's storyline dried up, so did the series. In many ways, the universe that accepts this film as a definitive end to the series is kind of where it's at. The finale includes lovely nods to the first and second films, and Jason's death is beautifully orchestrated and executed. After all, that was the sales pitch for this film. The tagline, Friday, April 13th, is Jason's unlucky day. That's what we went expecting to see, and that's what we saw. And just in case you thought they thought about bringing Jason back, well, this is pretty serious. And besides, it seemed almost inevitable that if the series did continue, it would continue with Tommy turning from protagonist to antagonist. It's a shame that never happened. Paramount Pictures, after seeing the returns on the final chapter, proceeded to make four more Friday the 13th films before handing the series over to New Line Cinema for two more sequels, a crossover, and joined New Line in 2009 for an attempted reboot. For those who want to delve into the series but don't have the time to dedicate to the franchise, this is the one to see. I'm Chaz Klimchak, and I'll see you again on Klimchak's Killer Collection. Do do do.